Well, folks, it's 2012. How many thought that you'd ever see 2012? Not going back to that says that they thought they'd see. It. <laughs> and we're here this morning, gathered together in God's house on the first Sunday in 2012. I want you to do something really quick. I want you to take a good look around in this building this morning. Take a good look. Is there anything different than it was this time last year? If you didn't realize it, there is a lot of difference. If I've done my calculations correctly, we lost five members in 2012. And as you look around this morning, the people that you see here, some of these folks may not be here at the beginning of 2013. As you look around also, you'll notice that there are some empty seats. And for one reason or another, those folks are here this morning. Some have legitimate excuses. Others have no excuse at all. They're just not here. <coughs> 2012 can either be a good year or a bad year. Watching the news this morning, they say the economy is going to level out in 2012. That the percentage of inflation will only be about 2%. So I, I kind of did a little calculation, you know, if, if it's going to be at 2% more, how can it be the same? But then they came back and said, well, it did the, the, it, that didn't include, guess what? Food and gasoline. <laughs> How will we do in this new year? Will we be busy? Will we make better use of our time? In 365 days from now, will we be looking back with joy or with regret? Will we be looking at the future with anticipation or regret? In the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 15 through 17, it says this. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord In these passages of Scripture, the Apostle Paul presents some important lessons that you and I need to consider as we begin this new year. 2011 has passed. We're in the first day of 2012. God has given us an opportunity for a new year to do things a little bit different. So what are we going to do? Paul gives us these things that we're going to mention. We're going to try to do it real quickly because somebody came up to me and said, Preacher, I hope you made a New Year's resolution to cut your short sermon just a little short. <laughs> What's Philip? <Bill? Are> <laughs> so we're going to try to push it along just a little bit. The first thing I want you to do you to consider out of the scripture verses that we've read this morning is that our time on this earth is limited. The Bible say, says that we have about, give or take, 72 years. That's in a best case scenario. If you're over 72 years of age right now, you need to bow your head at this moment and thank God that he has given you those extra years. You need to do that. 
because God has blessed you richly. <coughs> the, our time on this earth is limited. You and I must be very careful how we live because of that limitation of time. We need to understand that time, that time is precious. We understand too well a lot of, a lot of the uh, time how, how precious money is or how precious resources might be. But sometimes we just let time get away. The psalmist wrote, Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. Our life is a fleeting. In fact, when it's, it is compared to a vapor that appears and then disappears. The Bible also tells us not to count on tomorrow because tomorrow may no, never come. We are all the time saying, well, I'll do this tomorrow. And I know most of you probably carry in your pocket or pocketbook a calendar. I know Connie does. She has her life scripted from one moment to the next. But when you have a, a calendar, and don't y'all laugh at Connie because some of the rest of you do the same thing. Our life is strict. And if you're a, a parent, it's bad. You know, uh, when they get in school, it's Little League, base, uh, baseball, softball, basketball, football, sometimes soccer, sometimes other events, just all crammed in together. And when you have two kids, you know, the odds are that most people don't have twins. In fact, I think if you had two kids, you better pray for twins so they both have the same thing going on at the same time. But if you have two kids, that means that both parents have to, to swap up and one goes this way and one goes that way. And we have this whole thing stripped. But then all of a sudden, something steps in and messes up our plan. You know that I like to have things scripted. I like to know what's going to happen from one minute to the next. But sometimes things come in and, and we just are, are so, uh, uh, our schedule is so changed. <coughs> but the one thing I want you to understand this morning is that our time on this earth is limited and it won't be a schedule change, it will be a life change because you may go to meet God. And there's one thing that I'm very concerned about in 2012 is how many people really know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. How many people, if they died today, would spend eternity in heaven? How many people that are in our world today would, would have the grace and the mercy of Jesus flowing through their hearts and lives, their, their sins covered with His blood, and they're ready to go? The most important thing that you should do this in 2012 is to understand that your time is limited and that you need to make preparation to meet God. You say, well, I plan to live another hundred years. I do too. I hope, I hope at one time I'm as old as Brother Lester. Somebody said he was older than Turk. <laughs> But time <coughs> runs out. It's always disturbing for us to hear on the news that time ran out for a young child or an infant. They died for some reason. And our hearts break for them. But you know, God takes care of those young children. My heart really breaks when I read an obituary and I begin to start reading the obituary just to make sure my name's not there. But when you read an obituary and all they can say was that they attended church. 
That kind of breaks my heart. Or you read that there is no church whatsoever in their obituary. There's nothing there to tell you or to lead you to believe that they ever had an experience with Jesus. That should break our hearts. We are counting on tomorrow. But we need to understand that tomorrow may not come. Did you know that that in reality all that you and I have is right now? What we do right now makes all the difference in the world. And if you know of someone in, in your family or you know someone in this church and when church service is over, you need to run to them and you need to tell them about Jesus if they don't know him to save the Lord. You have right now to make a difference. Our time is the most valuable thing that you and I might have as we serve our Lord. And we need to understand that it's needed. Would you recognize an opportunity to hit you in the face? We need to make the most out of every opportunity. Paul tells us that we must make the most out of every opportunity. And he gives a reason because the days are evil. We live in an evil time. Don't we? You hear on the news every single day evil being perpetrated on someone. Evil is not just a, just in our neighborhood. It's not in Nashville. It's not in D.C. It's not in New York. But it's worldwide. And guess who is behind it? It's not Osama bin Laden. It's not Muammar Gaddafi. It's not Saddam Hussein. It's not some of those other people that we, we read about in the news that have been painted as, as, as the devil. It's the devil. It's Satan. In fact, Jesus said that Satan is a robber and a thief. And one of the things he tries to rob from us is our time because time is very precious possession. Opportunities that we have are sometimes time sensitive. I don't know whether any of you have ever worked on, on a job that was time sensitive. It had to be done. You couldn't put it off till tomorrow. You couldn't put it off for another hour. It had to be done now. I want you to think about something that time is very precious to us. And Satan tries to steal it. Just think of the time that we waste sinning. Now, I know there are no sinners in this house this morning. Everybody's so squeaky clean that, that I myself wouldn't get a bit of, bit of dirt off. Just think about the time that we spend sin. Think of the time wasted that some people waste in bars or in gambling casinos. We were a few days into the HGTV, and I've told you this before. She watches House Hunter, and they had a marathon on, I think it was yesterday or Friday morning. She was there watching. And I watched some of it too. And they had one episode where this couple was trying to find a house. And it wasn't just, they thought they were poor people. All they had to put in the house was $1.1 million. They thought they were poor. 
I mean, if I had $1.1 million, I could build a humongous house. But they thought they were cool. But you know what the biggest concern was for, that they had about a house? I bet you can think, think of a, a few things. But the biggest concern that they had for a house was that it would have a place for them to store their wine. Now, I know some of you are saying, preacher, you're beginning to meddle a little bit. But I don't care. If wine is the most important thing in your life, you need to have a reality check. Because Satan is robbing you of your time. He's robbing you of opportunities. If that's the most important thing in your life at the time, he's robbing you. Now it can be more than just, it can be something else other than wine. It can be anything that God, that Satan places in front of you that draws time away from your service to God. It can be drugs. Drugs is a big problem. It can be sports. It can be hunting and fishing. It can even be sitting at home in a recliner watching house hunters. <laughs> It's anything that, that draws away from your, your ability to, to serve in God's uh, army if that ruins your time. And Satan convinces you that all oh, everything's all right. Here's a good one. Think of the time wasted in gossiping or spreading rumors. Now, I know some of you would rather gossip than eat. We might have a gossip fest here one week. Can, can y'all can y'all think up another gossip? In fact, uh, Brother Lester to ask me occasionally said, "Got any rumors going on out at the base?" And I said, "No, not even." He said, "Have you started any lately?" <laughs> you know, if we if we can't find something to gossip about, we'll just start something. And it doesn't take much to start something. But just think, of, just think how, how much productive time we waste telling things that probably aren't true. I want you to understand something. It's not just bad things. It's not just sin that makes demands on our time and ruins our opportunities. But sometimes even good things make demands. There's a story in the Bible of where a good thing actually was bad. Do you remember the story of Jesus going to the home of Martha and Mary and Lazarus? He sat down to teach and <clears throat> Mary was there at his feet just soaking everything in. And old Martha was out in the kitchen a cooking away. She was just a, a throwing, throwing beans and taters everywhere. They have probably not beans and taters. But she was preparing dinner. And finally old Martha had had enough. There was that lazy thing, Mary, sitting at the feet of Jesus, doing absolutely nothing, all gooey-eyed and everything, looking at Christ, listening to everything that he's saying. And she's had enough. It's time for, for Mary to get up off of, the, off of the floor and come in there and help her prepare those meals. So Martha takes her case to Jesus. That Jesus, that old gal is lazy as all get out. She won't even help me get, get your supper ready. Folks, Martha was so preoccupied with what she was doing that she didn't realize that God was in her living room. 
And sometimes we get so preoccupied in the good things of this world that we don't realize that God is in our living room. We miss opportunities. We miss times when God can use us, when He can change, when He can change us, and when He can point us to someone that we need to help. How many missed opportunities have you had over the years? Where you've been doing something that you thought was so important and so good that you just really didn't realize that Jesus was sitting right beside it. We need to make a, make a resolution, a New Year's resolution, that we're going to seek out those opportunities that Jesus and God puts before. Stop wasting our time. We need to understand what the Lord's will is. Paul tells us in these verses that we read, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. You say, well, I don't know what His will is. That's a cop out you do. You understand quite well what His will is. First of all, you need to establish priorities. Y'all know what priorities are? That's what you're going to do first. And since you're in church this morning, I'm assuming that you believe God should be a part of your life because you're in church this morning. And let me say this to you this morning. When you establish your priorities, Here's how this should work. If God and Christ and the church are number one, everything else will take its rightful place. When you ask people today what their priorities are, some people will actually tell you that it's their job. My career. It's kind of amazing. Football players, athletes, let's don't just take one. Athletes have a career. They make millions of dollars. I think they're overpaid. I think they're grossly overpaid. But that's the nature of the beast. But here's what can happen to their career. In what, take football, for instance, in one game, They're snapping the ball. And the, then the two lines collide. Everybody scatters except one person. That one person may have just suffered a life-changing experience. Not for the good, but his career is over. <coughs> Those millions of dollars that he thought he would make over the, over the course of his playing career is now gone. <clears throat> Folks, careers can be shattered in the blink of an eye. But God is forever. God is forever. And when we put God and Christ and the church as number one, everything else, even our family, will fall into place. The second thing we need to do is learn how to live today. <coughs> the two greatest enemies of time are regrets for things we did in the past and anxiety about what will happen to us in the future. Do you relive, do you relive things that happened in the past? Some of you are probably rolling over your mind this morning. Well, if I had just done this in 2011. Well, you can't change the past. What was it we said? All you have is today. And then you begin to think about tomorrow. I worried myself sick. Because... Did y'all know on Tuesday I've got to go back to work? <laughs> I've got to go back to work. 
I've enjoyed being off. I believe I can take retirement pretty easy, brother. Al. But I've enjoyed being off. And I caught myself yesterday thinking about going to work on Tuesday. What was it we're saying? May not make it till Tuesday. But we worry about things that haven't even happened yet. Have you ever been guilty of worrying about something and then when that something actually happened, it wasn't anything like you thought it would be? Worried for nothing. The two greatest enemies of our time is regrets about things in the past and anxiety about things in the future. Someone that says life is what happens to you while you're making plans to do something else. Folks, the Lord's will for your life is to serve Him today. Not tomorrow. Not in the past. But today. And when we say we don't know what God's will is for us, it's that, <coughs> that we serve Him. But before you serve Him, you have to know Him. And there's two types of knowing. <coughs> One is the intellectual knowing. And the second is the heartfelt. A lot of people know God intellectually. A lot of people know about Christ intellectually. But they really have never experienced the love and the grace and the mercy that Jesus gave on the cross of Calvary. You need to know Him. And this morning, the Holy Spirit may be working in your life, helping you begin to know Him. Welcome that intervention. Our prayer today should be, another year has come and gone, a new year stretches before us. Lord, help me redeem the time. Our time is short. Someone else wrote, and during the new year, may you have enough happiness to keep you sweet. Wow, it'd be really sweet. Enough trials to keep you strong. Enough sorrow to keep you human. Enough hope to keep you happy. Enough failure to keep you humble. Enough success to keep you eager. Enough friends to give you comfort. Enough wealth to meet your needs. Now you, you realize that, she, that this person didn't say your wants, he said needs. Enough enthusiasm to make you look forward to tomorrow. And enough determination to make each day better than the day before. The only way you can make each day better than the day before is to know Jesus. Romans 13, 11 and 12 says this. And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. For our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. 2012, folks. Are you going to make it stay the same as 2011? Or are you going to make it better? The only way you can make it better is with a right relationship with Jesus, a right relationship with God, and a right relationship with His church. And the way you do that is with Jesus. 
My prayers for you in 2012 is this. That everyone come to know Jesus is Savior. And that every time someone comes to know Him as Savior and Lord, we rejoice and begin to disciple that person so they can win someone to Jesus. We talk about Lottie Moon. We talk about Annie Armstrong. We talk about all the different mission uh, emphasis that, that we have during the year. But the biggest mission emphasis should be on your life. Because guess what? You may not be in Rio, you may not be in Vietnam, you may not be in, in Russia or China, but right now you're in Coffee County, Tennessee. It has a mission field of its own. And people here need Jesus too. And it starts with you. Father, Help us to redeem the time that you've given us. Help us to see the opportunities that are so, so glaring before us. And Father, help us to be committed to serving you. Father, I pray now that you would empower us through the Holy Spirit to be your witnesses. I also pray, dear God, that you would cleanse us from all of the things that are hindering us. That you would help us see Satan for who he really is. And help us to see the stumbling blocks that he places before us. I pray that you would set the hearts of Christians on fire this morning. And Heavenly Father, cause them to do your will and your work. I pray this morning that you would touch the hearts of those that are here that don't know Jesus as Savior. Lord. And I pray as the Holy Spirit works in, the, in those folks' lives that the rest of us will be praying that that experience with, with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus will be real and have the Father that uh, that person just can't help but come to know Him as Savior. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would have your will and your way as we sing this invitation song this morning. I pray that you would lead all that are here to make decisions that need to be made. But God, give us a new vision for 2012. Put us squarely in the center of things and cause us to rely on you more. For we ask it all in Jesus. If God has spoken to you this morning through the Holy Spirit and you feel like He's leading you to come, won't you do so? Won't you come forward and, and tell your desires and your, your commitments to this church?